rise and join us at the altar for praise and worship.
ashes of defeat. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. In your name I come alive to declare your victory. Your name.
Some people only care about themselves. No one cares about your stupid vacation. Some people treat others poorly. Do it have anarchy. Times, right? There's no. certain things that are right and there's certain things that are sense. wrong. No. So don't believe what all these foolishness. Everybody Some people only care one. about being right. There are we are one. We are one. Some people don't seem worth the time. But the truth is. Most people are just working to get by. Most people are terrified to reveal their scars. Most people are fighting an invisible battle. Sir, you forgot a bag. Most people are worth the effort. Because all people are created in the image of God. Where's my pillow? All people carry the glow of the divine. All people matter enough for God to become one of them. God thinks every person is worthy of love. Imagine if we did too. Let's be a church where everybody's welcome. Nobody's perfect. And anything is possible. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to Friday night at VBC Houston. Uh, we definitely uh, appreciate y'all for coming out, taking the time out, and uh, spending time with us. And uh, before we get started, I actually want to start off by praying for Pastor Sam and Pastor Khan as they are away ministering. So Pastor Khan is in San Jose, California, and Pastor Sam is in Denver, Colorado. Uh, so I just want to just take a time just to pray for them. Lord, we thank you for Pastor Khan and for Pastor Sam. We thank you that your spirit is with them. Where they are, we know that your kingdom will come and your will will be done. Lord, I pray that you open their hearts to receive the good news. Lord, we bless their feet that brings good news. Lord, we pray that no weapon formed against them will prosper. We even pray and thank you for your grace and travels, and we look forward to a good report when they return. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, um, some of you guys may be familiar with this new craze that's happening on social media, and this craze involves something called the Face App, and there's this challenge that's going on. Right? And this challenge is so called hashtag face challenge. Is that right? Or the age challenge? Age challenge? So, what this app does is that it allows you to put a current picture of yourself or someone else into the app, and then it applies an age filter or old age filter, and it pretty much predicts what you will look like in your old age or 40 years from now. And so I actually have a few examples. <laughs> so this is, this is me, of course, probably about 40 years, years from now. And let's see, we have a, a few more. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's another one. Man, them, uh, them bags, though. Uh, let's see. And we have a few others that you may be familiar with. You guys know who that is? It's Pastor Sam. We have another one. Faith. Faith Bryant. And then we got Mike. Mike Wynn. 
And so after, you know, we kind of laugh about these things and see this app, it kind of encouraged me or prompted me to think about, you know, what if there was an app that could see where our current lifestyle is and project it in our old age, 20, 30, 40 years from now, and based on our current lifestyle, what would that app produce? And what will it show us who will be years down the line? And so would it project us to have great influence? Would it project us to have great relationships? Um, would it even show that we're in a place now to where we have clarity and knowing where the Holy Spirit of God is leading us? Or um, better yet, would it even reveal that when the time comes, will we have assurance in eternity with our Lord? On the other side, will it show that we have broken relationships? Or would it show that we're, we ended up being someone with a heart and heart? Or someone who uh, despises the things of God, and even to the point to where when that time comes, we're actually fearing death. So I want you guys to think about that for a second, that you have that app. Let's just call it the Life app, the Life Projection app. What would it project you to be based on your current lifestyle today? What will you see? Just uh, chew on that for a second. And so back to the, um, the Face app. I want you guys to put my Face app back on the screen if you can. You know, the first thing most people would do after they saw their old age outcome, is they would do what? They would think of ways that they can actually reduce those effects. Or what can they do today to make sure they don't look like that in the future? Right? And so for me, when I look at that, I'm like, oh man, them bags, that tells me right away, I need to get some more sleep. Right? I need to drink some more water. Um, you know, Faith Brian, she even said that she needs to invest in some eye cream. You know, some people may feel like after looking at that outcome, they may feel like, oh, you know what, I need to start working out. I need to start eating better. Um, I need to start drinking more water. And so in the same way that there are actions that we can take today to alter a future projection of how we will look, it's the same way that there are actions that we can take today that would help change us or put us on a different trajectory in our lifestyle. And so, although we don't have this future life app, what we do have is the Word of God. And the Word of God is there to show us how we are to live and what that looks like. So, I want you guys to turn with me to Matthew chapter 22, verse 36 and 40. When you guys get there and then say amen, I know some of you got your, your iPhones and iPads, and we also have it up here on the, on the screen for you. So, Matthew chapter 22. Verse 36, this is actually coming from uh, a time when some of the folks in the religious community approached Jesus, and they asked him about, you know, what are the greatest commandments? And they were actually trying to test him, because they believe that all of them are equally important. You should be doing all of them. And so this is what Jesus says. You shall love the Lord your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Number one. Then Jesus says, this is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. 
So the law was considered to be a set of, of instructions or a set of rules on how you should live your life to be pleasing to the Lord. And whether you see that as the Ten Commandments, whether you see that as some of the Hebrew laws, and actually there were over almost, well, there's actually almost 700 commandments that God's people had to follow. They felt like they had to follow to, our, to be pleasing to him. But Jesus, he actually made it easy for it. He actually narrowed it down just to two commandments. And he says, on these two commandments fulfill all the law. The first one is to love the Lord with all your heart, your mind, and your soul. And the second one is to love your neighbor as yourself. Amen? And so, let's start with loving God. Where do you start when it comes to loving God? So my wife, who is somewhere around here, I had to start somewhere to get to the place to where I love her, right? And that starts with me getting to know her. And so, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. So if we want to get to know God the Father so that we can love him, we have to know Jesus. Jesus says he is the way, He is the truth and he is the life and no man comes to me or no man comes to the Father except through me. So you actually see the goal of a Christian isn't even to go to heaven. That's not even the end goal. The goal is to know the Father. And in knowing the Father... You will receive peace and comfort, and you will know who you are. It's identity. And so in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, I'll just say the verse. God created man in his image, in his likeness, and he gave them dominion over the birds of the fields, the fish of the sea, So God created you to be just like who? Him. So God created man in in the image of himself and in the likeness of himself, and he gave them dominion. So God created us in his image, in his likeness, and he also gave us his dominion. Now, we lost that image, we lost that likeness, and we lost that dominion when, obviously, Adam and Eve ate of the tree They sin, they turn away from God, that relationship is broken, and now Jesus comes on the scene. Jesus comes, and he pretty much declares himself as a son of God. And he says, those who believe in me will not perish, but have everlasting life. And as a son of God, Jesus is from God. And so through the Son of God, we have become children of God. You guys follow me? So through Jesus, when we believe in him, we become sons of God. And just as Jesus is from God, now we are from God. We have a new spiritual Father in heaven that loves us. And so, in knowing God, we have to know Jesus. And so what do we have to know about Jesus that causes us to be in love with him? For one, Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. Did you guys get that? Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin. For who? For us. So that we might become the righteousness of God. 
So we have to know Jesus in order for us to love God. And in that, loving God with all our heart, our mind, our souls, there's many verses in the Bible that points to what that looks like. And I'm just actually going to just make things a little bit, you know, relevant to us today. You know, in knowing God with our soul, a lot of people say that music is pretty much like a pathway to the soul. So then we got to think about, okay, what kind of music are we listening? Is the music that we're listening that's getting to our soul, is that sort of leading us further to God or driving us further away or closer to God and then further away? And even our minds, the things we think about, we should be thinking about things that are pure and holy and righteous, things of good things. And so to help us with that, you know, right now, what is dominating our society, our culture, our environment is technology. And an extension of that is social media. So we got Facebook, we got Instagram, we got Snapchat, Twitter. Twitter. And so I remember I heard, you know, Pastor Maggie, she used to come and, you know, share the word with us. She would say, you know, let's spend less time in Facebook and more time in the book. And I've sort of added on to that. With Instagram, instead of let's spend less time on Instagram and more time in just Insta prayer. You know, Instagram, at an instant, you can just send something. Like, boom, 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 send something. Right? At an instant. How about we apply that to our life to where in an instant we just pray? We just pray for our family, our friends, our coworkers. Something that we see in an instant that happens, we don't know what else to do, but we can pray. We don't have to take a video of it, make sure we get on social media, make sure we get some likes, some followers. We want it to go viral, even at the cost of someone's life. What about Snapchat? You know, let's spend a little less time on Snapchat, a little more time chatting with the Lord. (laughs) You know, there are times when I just find myself just talking with the Lord. Anytime, anywhere, and what it has done each and every day, I'm pretty much proving to myself that, Lord, you're here with me. You are here with me. You're here right now with me. Wherever I go, you're with me. And even though I don't see you, even though I don't hear you, literally hear you, even though I don't feel you, smell you, taste you, but I know you're here, and it's by faith. So that's the first commandment, love God. So in order to love God, it's important to know Jesus, know the price he paid, see your identity through the price he paid, and your value through the price he paid, and move forward in life, knowing Jesus so that you can actually know the Father. So with Jesus saying, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, he's saying, follow my way, believe my truth, and live my life. And in doing so, you will know the Father. And in doing so, you will love the Father. You guys follow me? So now to the second commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. What does that mean? Who is our neighbor? So I'm going to go to Luke chapter 10. And you guys can follow along with me. And so in Luke chapter 10, this is actually the same event that took place when Jesus gave them the two commandments. 
to love God and love your neighbor. And in Luke, he sort of adds another detail to this event. And this is what happens. So there was another person in the religious community that came up to Jesus. So verse 29, but he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? So we have someone actually asking the question, who is my neighbor? And this is what Jesus says. He gives them, he gives them, you know, three different scenarios. He says, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among the thieves. Meaning that he was, he was jumped, he was whooped, he was in an alley. You know, someone, they came out, knocked him over his head, he's out. And they stripped him of his clothing, so now he's probably naked. Wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. So we have this man that's been jumped, they've been beat up, half his clothes are gone, and he's dying. He's half dead. Now, by chance, a certain priest came down that road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. You guys ever been somewhere and you... (laughs) So we just, my wife and I, we just came from New York. And on the streets, there are a lot of different characters in New York. And when you see a character that's just strange enough, you may be encouraged to walk on the other side of the street, right? Just so that you won't be approached by him or, you know, they may do something crazy, you know, whatever. You just see all kinds of stuff in New York. You see it here too. So in this case, a priest sees a man, this man that's been beaten, wounded. And what did he do? What what does he, what does he do? I don't even know if that's proper grammar or not. Julie, make you know me. But, He walks on the other side of the street, pays no attention to the man because it's an inconvenience. I got something to do. I got places to go. You know, time is money. I don't got time. That's not my problem. Someone else can do it. Someone else can help them. I got to go. And likewise, there was a Levite. And a Levite was actually, if you're a Levite, you're someone who is a part of this holy priesthood. You're part of the Levites. And a lot of the Levites, they were priests and they were assistants to the priests. And some of them were actually, you, you, you can actually only go in certain holy places if you were a Levite. I think, I believe there were only the Levites were allowed to carry the Ark of the Covenant. Um, And so this is a Levite, and he says, When he arrived at the place, he came and looked, and he passed on the other side too. So we have two scenarios. We have a priest and a Levite who passed on the other side. But a certain Samaritan... You could just see a certain Samaritan as your everyday citizen walking down the street. No title, no, you know, specific role in the things of God. He's just a Samaritan walking down the street. As he journeyed, he came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So when so he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and he set him on his animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. So now we have the Samaritan who sees the man that's beaten up, bruised, about to die. He takes time and he stops what he's doing. He stops his life to care for the need of someone else. He even puts him on his animal or his, probably his donkey, his horse, whatever it was, and takes them to the nearest hotel. And on the next day when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, 
and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So now money is involved. So now he got to dish out the dough. So it's not only costing them time, but now it's costing them money. But he tells the innkeeper, he tells the hotel manager, that, hey, there's this guy that I just booked in his room. He's pretty banged up. Can you do this for me? Can you actually take care of him? And here's some money. Spend that to take care of him. And if you find yourself spending more than what I gave you, let me know. I'll cover it. And then Jesus says, Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And now this religious person says, He who showed mercy on him, of course. Then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. So answering the question, who is our neighbor? Our neighbor could be anyone. It's us being a neighbor to them. Whether it means a sacrifice of time, a sacrifice of money, of resources, You know, I've had some people in my life that have been neighbors to me. You know, Nim and Audrey is here today. Uh, There was a time when, you know, I was working in Houston, living in Hitchcock at home. My mom was here today, uh, you know, making that trip. And they was like, I remember Audrey was like, dude, what are you doing? We have a place. We have space. Come live with us. I was like, really? I was like, yeah, for sure. And it's funny because I remember talking to them. I was like, man, you know, I've been living here. And I'm like, man, this, this year has passed by so fast. And them was like, it's been like three years. <laughs> I was like, man, it's really fast by really fast. Um, even, you know, Joe Torres. I remember Joe Torres when I was... Um, going through some crazy financial troubles, didn't really tell anyone. But somehow or another, you know, he found out a little something and he was just start taking me to Chick-fil-A. Like, it was like, it was like every other day, it was like, hey, Paul, you want Chick-fil-A? Hey, Paul, you want Chick-fil-A? Hey, Paul, you want Chick-fil-A? Time, money, space, all these things that would seem like an inconvenience. I was, um, I ordered something from Amazon the other day, and some came, some happened to where the package didn't get to where it was supposed to, it wasn't delivered at my house, and it ended up being stuck at the UPS office, or the, the, the U.S. Postal Service. And I remember I was like, ah, oh, such an inconvenience, now I gotta go. Find time, they close at five, you know, I get off at five, I got to figure this out, go to UPS, I mean, I mean, I go to, you know, where my package is, I walk in, and the guy at the counter, I don't know what it is, but something about him was, it was just like, man, this is someone you would be really good friends with, like, be great friends. And I'm just like, man, I got to get my package. And I remember he comes out, and now I see he's, like, walking with, like, he has some type of leg condition that's going on. And I'm like, I'm trying to get my package, Lord. (laughs) Um, We start talking, you know, they couldn't find my package. Finally, he brings out my package. He's like, oh, you know, we found it. It was in the back. And I was like, okay, thank you. So now I'm like still frustrated because I'm like, okay, there's supposed to be two items, and I'm, it looks like it's supposed to be two packages, so it's only one package. It was my other package, another inconvenience. The whole time I'm looking at this guy, wondering myself, man, 
Lord, there's something that, there's something you want me to do, something you want me to say, but I'm inconvenienced. I want to get home. I get my package, I look at them, and I leave. And on the way home, I'm like dying on the inside, dying on the inside. And I'm like, oh. I'm like, Lord, what am I doing? This is, this is, what am I doing? I know you're leading. I know what you're trying to get me to do. I know what's, what, you know, you're, I know what I'm supposed to do. And I just, I just continue on because of an inconvenience. And I remember getting home. And I called Amazon because I was trying to make sure that the item that I bought, I believe it was like a Wi-Fi router, I was like trying to figure out if I opened the package, would they still allow me to return it if I didn't like it? And, um, and I tried to clarify that. So I called, I was like, no, you know, actually if you open it, uh, we still, I mean, we can, we'll, you can return it, but we'll still charge you a restocking fee. So I'm like, ah, of course. So... At that moment, I'm like, you know what? I don't care who this person is, what they're going through. I'm praying for them. Because I was so, like, like, convicted by the post office situation. So at the end of the call, I'm like, you know, ma'am, can I pray for you? Is there something I can pray for? I think I ever said, do you have pain in your body? She's like, no, I don't have pain. Then I said, is there any person in your family that has pain? And she said, my daughter has sickle cell. I said, oh. I said, okay, that's definitely something we can pray. She's like, yes, please. We prayed, and she's just like, thank you so much for praying for me. Definitely was expecting that. Thank you. Um, and that right there just sort of encouraged me to say, Paul, an inconvenience is just that. It's an inconvenience. It's a temporary momentary inconvenience. Even if it's money, it's just that. Money comes, it goes. You know, it, we spend it, we save it, we give it. It's, it's just a cycle. And so our neighbor is anyone that we can care for, even if it requires some resources, time, um, space, whatever it is. So with these two commandments, I know that sometimes it can be difficult for some people. I know it may be hard for someone to believe that, actually I can, that I, they can actually live that out every single day with all that's going on around us, all the busyness of life, the worries of life, the tasks, our calendar, to-do lists, the bills. And you may be asking yourself, man, how... Even though, you know, it's been simplified as just these two commandments, even still, how can I live this way? So I want to encourage you with Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. Hebrews chapter 4 says, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we might obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. In times when we feel like we're insufficient, like we don't have what we need to live the life God has called us to, let us go to the throne of grace. Grace is literally the empowering force that allows you to do something. So we are saved by faith through grace. Excuse me, we are saved by grace through faith. So grace is what empowers us to live the life that God has called us to. But the only way that we can live that life is through faith. And what is faith? Faith is a substance of things hoped for 
It's the evidence of things not seen. Faith is pretty much summed up into believing in something with no tangible evidence. Like I mentioned before, you can't see it, you can't feel it, you can't taste it, you you can't hear it, but you believe it to be true. That's what faith is. And so, turn with me And I'm actually wrapping things up to Romans chapter 5, verse 1. And it says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So we have access by faith into this grace. This is an access card. I need this car to get into the parking garage of where I work every single day. This car grants me access into that garage. Without this car, guess what? I don't got a place to park for work, right? Without this car, I do not have the access I need to that garage. It could be a hotel car. How many of you guys have rented a hotel and they gave you a car for access to your room, right? Without that car, you can't what? Get into your room, right? So, if faith is our access into grace, without faith, we cannot live the life we're called to live. Without faith, we cannot access the grace that empowers us to step into righteousness. Without faith, we cannot access the ability to love our neighbor as we love ourselves, to love God with all our heart, mind, body, and soul. Without faith, There is no access to any of God's promises. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So you believe it to be true. Even if you don't feel it, even if you don't feel like doing something or feel like going there or feel like giving this or feel like giving that, you know, I heard, real quick, I heard, um, you know, Dan Moeller share a testimony. So this is like secondhand to me that I heard from someone else. And it was about a, a guy who was, became a Christian and he couldn't stop smoking. And he was kind of discouraged because like, man, I'm a Christian. I say I believe and I just, I just can't stop smoking. So obviously, he has a conversation with Dan Moeller. And Dan Moeller is, uh, you know, a man of God. Uh, when I was living with him in Audrey, and when he was in town ministering to, um, you know, PCC, their church, he was next door to me in the same house. <laughs> So I definitely have first-hand experience of who this guy is. Um, so Dan pretty much encouraged this guy to have faith. That even while he's smoking the cigarette, declare in your own life that, God, this is not who I am. This isn't who you created to me, me to be. This isn't my identity. I thank you, Lord, that this isn't, this isn't for me. This isn't my portion but he's still smoking it. Like while he's smoking it, he's praying this. He's declaring life over his life. He's believing by faith, even though he's what? He's still smoking it. So this goes on for days, 
weeks. And all of a sudden, I don't know how many days or how many weeks went by, one day he stopped and he couldn't remember the last time he picked up a cigarette. Faith. This is what your faith does. When your faith gives you access to the grace, then that grace turns your faith into a reality. Grace turns your faith into a reality for your life. So, Faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God. So regardless of what app you're using, regardless of what area in your life that you're not pleased with, regardless of the environment you're in by faith you believe it to be true God's promises for your life that you are more than a conqueror you are not the tail but you are the head that all things are possible Mark 9 and 19 says, If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. If you can believe, this is from the words of Jesus. All things are possible to him who believes. So right now, there's something that's been brewing causing a big debate within Christians. And it started with the Bachelorette. And on the Bachelorette, the whole debate starts when someone lives a life outside of Christ, lives like the world, and they say, Jesus still loves me. Almost like a mic drop. Like, yeah, I did this, but Jesus still loves me. <laughs> it's true. Jesus loves them very much Jesus also said if you love me you'll obey my commandments so the question is not whether Jesus loves you but do you love him Truth is, Jesus loves all of us. He loves the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And whoever, whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world. Who is the world? Everyone. That includes the terrorist. That includes the murderer. 
that includes the thief, that includes the rapists, that includes the sex traffickers. So if your claim to fame is, oh, Jesus loves me, he loves everyone. Not to say you're not special, because you are. But it makes you no different than anyone in the world as a believer. So, I encourage you, for those of you who have not yet believed on the Lord Jesus, I encourage you to operate in faith. You may not believe it to be true, you may not hear his voice, you may think, Jesus freaks are freaks. But I encourage you to apply faith and believe. He is the way, He is the truth, and He is the life. And no man comes to the Father except through Him. For those of you who do believe, and you may be struggling or there may be a matter in your life or an area in your life that you know is not pleasing to the Lord and you want to stop you don't want to do this anymore you don't want to do that anymore you don't want to uh, fornicate you don't want to watch pornography you don't want to do drugs you don't want to get drunk but you feel like you just can't stop. I encourage you to have faith. Believe that you are a son or a daughter of the kingdom of heaven. And you're better than those things. Persevere in that belief and faith, and that will grant you access to the grace to live as you should. So right now, the altar is open. Anyone who desire prayer, we welcome you up to the altar. We have leaders here that will pray for you. Today is actually my birthday. Just so happens to be on the day that I was asked to be with you guys. And discover new birth in Christ. Discover new birth in Christ. So once again, guys, thank y'all for coming out. We enjoyed y'all. It's going to be a night of fellowship after this. We're going to celebrate my birthday over in the COC on the other side. So like I said before, the altar is open. Um, but you guys are free to fellowship and uh, have a good time and enjoy one another in Christ. Amen? Amen. All right.